Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote interview for this morning, which I think um, most of you would, would agree um, brings together two of the really key figures, um, certainly from the last 20 years in the independent music scene, namely Jonathan Poneman, who is the CEO and co-founder of Sub Pop Records, who I guess their success um, as an independent label really redefined the playing field globally for what an independent label could represent and the kinds of uh, markets that an indie label could reach and was, was the vehicle for really um, transforming um, music into, you know, stylistically in many ways in terms of the music that came out of the Seattle scene, um, particularly the grunge scene. Um, and, and marrying up um, Jonathan with uh, Everett True, who um, Everett um, has a long-standing um, background or track record as a music journalist in the UK. Um, Everett was editor of Melody Maker and also worked for NME, um, the, the two key publications in the UK and currently runs uh, Plan B magazine. But importantly, in terms of this particular uh, keynote interview, Everett was one of the main writers about the uh, Seattle scene and um, he and Jonathan have spent many, many uh, hours um, talking about those developments in that scene um, over the last 15 years. Um, Everett's written a range of books um, on the scene and various aspects of it, so it's a really exciting opportunity to hear these two gentlemen um, discuss the world and everything uh, live for you today. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, Jonathan Poneman and Everett True. Hi, my name's Everett True. My name is Jonathan. Pleased to meet you. And today, um, uh, we're going to be talking about Jonathan's past and future. How about it? Okay. Well, Jonathan, I guess um, just to provide a bit of background to the people here, um, could you just explain how you came to be in Seattle um, in the mid-80s and how you came to start up a record label? First of all, my name is Jonathan Poneman, and um, I'm from Seattle, Washington. I'm the president of Sub Pop Records. Um, I went, moved out to Washington State from the uh, Midwest, the American Midwest, um, in the late 70s, and uh, attended the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, at the time, I played in a bunch of really crummy rock bands, and um, I figured I had a scheme. I had it all figured out. So you people trying to break into the music industry, listen to me. What I did is I got a radio show, a local music radio show at radio station KCMU in Seattle, Washington. And I figured I'd get on the air and start playing my band's tapes. This was the early 80s, so there were still cassette tapes. And I figured there'd be like a, a storm. People would just be calling up the telephone and calling uh, the station wanting to hear more and more of my band's music, but uh, that didn't happen. So, but what did happen is I became aware of uh, a lot of the bands whose members were actually uh, spending time down at uh, the radio station with me, some of whom were students, some of whom were just vol volunteers at the radio station, one of whom was a gentleman named Mark Arm, who sang in a group called Green River, later became the singer in Mud Honey and guitar player, principal songwriter. Another guy was a gentleman named Kim Thiel, who later became a uh, principal songwriter and guitar player in a group called Soundgarden. And Charles Peterson, who's since become a pretty well-known photographer, and a bunch of other people. Uh, and it was there that uh, I met my future partner, uh, Bruce Pavitt, who had already started the Sub Pop record label. Uh, but we both got tired of our, our respective jobs around mm, 1987. And so uh, on April Fool's Day, 1988, Bruce quit Muzak and I quit Kinko's and we went into business uh, as a full-time record label called Sub Pop Records. And uh, 20 years later, I'm talking to you. <laughs> it's beautiful. So um, Brown M&M's, not cool. 
Could you just explain to the um, assembled people here, Jonathan, what Muzak was? Because I find this really interesting. When I, I first went out to Seattle to do a story on these guys in 1989, February 1989, yes. um, I think. And one, they told me a bunch of lies and bullshit, quite frankly, um, which I loved because I was from the British music press and that's what we existed upon. And one of the stories they told me was that they all worked, they all came together in this um, company called Muzak, which supplied elevator music, you know, that horrible kind of tinny music you hear in shopping, or you used to hear in shopping malls and mm -hmm. elevators. And I printed this story because I always figured, well, you know, this is quite clearly complete bullshit. Um, but I'm interested to know that you're still running with it 20 years later. Yeah, well, couldn't think of anything better. Really, we all met at a 7-Eleven. We were all um, stocking the shelves at a 7-Eleven. No, we, Jerry, I hate to, uh, Everett, I mean, or Legend or whatever your name is. Uh, I hate to tell you, but we really all did meet at Muzak. The Muzak Corporation was based in Seattle, and as uh, the legend aptly puts it, uh, the Muzak at the time... Now they specialize in what's called foreground music, which is the licensing of music by your favorite contemporary artists and uh, finding the appropriate environment for that music is a big scam. Anyway, but at the time when Bruce and I were working there, it would be classic, what we call in the States, elevator music. You may call it the same thing here, I don't know. But it was these really um, breezy interpretations of hit songs, uh, well, from the time at the time it was hit songs from the 60s and 70s. Now I imagine they're doing like uh, grunge. Yeah, grunge, silver chair, stuff like that. You know. So um, I had to work silver chair in there somehow. 